pleasure to be with you again. We were together a couple of weeks back for a couple of weeks before then. And I'm afraid I'm being, uh, I was challenging, challenged. I made a mistake. I said we'd be off for one week, we were off for two weeks, and we're back together tonight. And please drive next week also. Uh, the first two sessions, uh, if you were with us, we have a bunch of us signed on, okay? And a bunch of us with us here. And I, I imagine some people will be coming on later on and some will be watching at their leisure. Uh, what we covered in the past was what's known in Hebrew as in your name alone and met matters of the world of truth, which means to say the afterlife, the messianic era, the, uh, the Yatame things, which is the dead coming back to life, and Alam Haba, which is the world to come. And now we're going to be talking about the point of it all. And uh, next week we're going to talk about human suffering. Uh, we've lumped them all together, these last few all together, uh, the points of uh, waxing and waning philosophical and, and human suffering because they kind of go together. When we suffer, God forbid, we wonder why we do and we wonder what's going on. And all right, so since we spent a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks back, on the afterlife and its sexual. That was like the background. Now, if you remember, okay, when you were like uh, eight, right, or something happened in school, right, something bad, maybe somebody bullied you, right, or you did something bad, and then you were saying, oh, no, I'm in trouble now, okay? And then you didn't get in trouble, right? And then three days later, the principal calls you in, and there are your folks in the office. Oh, my gosh, I'm in trouble now. Well, why did your folks come there a few days later and nothing happened in between? Well, the truth of the matter, as you well know now, as an adult and probably as a parent, because there was a lot of stuff going on in the background, a lot of phone calls, perhaps emails, right? Principal, assistant principal, perhaps, teacher, got involved. A lot of communication was going behind the background. Nothing we said to you until that day, okay? And then, ta-da, everybody's there. You, your folks, and perhaps the bullies folks, right? Or the victims folks, right? And perhaps the bully or the victim are there with you, too. So there's this hubbub, right? Ten people or so, eight people. And all of a sudden, things started to get noisy and active, and you thought this was all over with, you know? But no, this is where it really begins. So life is like that, okay? Life is like that, too, and we covered it the last session. So you thought what you see is what you get, and that's it, right? But no. Most of what happens happens in the background, and then you have to reckon for it, okay? have to get a reckoning for it. All right, so the point of it all is like that, too, okay? Now, I had a, a, a sobering experience today as a hospital rabbi, as I've often joked about it, oh, thank God. It would go crazy if he did. But a rather philosophical occasion occurred today. We're going to talk about that pretty soon, and I'm going to try to tie it in with our point here today. Okay, I just wanted to throw that in. It just happened, you know, with God felt this thing happen, and I thought it was very spot on, and I wanted to bring it in. I'll bring it in in a bit. Now, um, our main point tonight is not to study text, but to study ourselves, Okay. Our fallback text is Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. If you've done your homework, and it's okay, I won't check, but if you've done your homework and you've read Kohelet, it's a rather depressing text. It kind of questions everything religious, and it kind of questions everything philosophic. It kind of questions what you're here for, okay? It's an unexpected text. 
And in fact, there was an argument among the sages in antiquity whether Ecclesiastes or Kohelet should be included in the Torah. So some, most voted yes, some voted no. Because, they're, first of all, they contradict itself. It says this one time, a couple of chapters down the road, it says another thing. And besides that, there's this factor where it seems to be unreligious, okay? Seems to be rather laissez-faire and rather ho-hum about things, okay? But before we touch upon the text and again, if you're struggling with something, now is the time. You can do it privately so that no one else can read your name. Okay, there are accommodations for that. You send me a private message and I won't cite your name, but I'll cite your point or your question. Okay? And I would really like it to be there. I prefer not to do a text class. The first two classes we had together was rather textual and it's rather factual and it's data driven. But I'd like our these two classes to be person driven, okay? If you have your questions about the point of it all, now it's your chance. Stump the rabbi, okay? God knows I don't have all the answers. That only know. But I've read some of the best of them. And some of them I actually remember, okay? And some of them I will draw upon my personal experience working with the very ill, the very elderly, the dying. So, uh, first of all, let me give you three instances in the Torah, in Tanakh, where in fact there is mention of reflection. The first one is, of course, is, is God's own reflection. In the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 6, uh, after Adam and Eve blew it big time, right? God regretted having made human beings on the earth, and his heart is deeply troubled. It's sort of saying that God said, hmm, why did I do that? Why did I create humanity if they're going to blow it like that? So God's question is, what's the point of it all? And that's our title, right? What's the point of it all? Why did I, why did I create people? Or from our experience, why were we created by God? The next famous uh, point of reflection is Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu, in this week's parasha, this week's reading, which we'll read this coming Shabbat, because the, our people committed the sin of the Chetah uh, Egel, the golden calf, Moses said, and Moses was displeased by that, and he started having second thoughts, God, what am I doing being the leader of the Jewish nation if I'm not even paying attention, okay? Forgive me if I'm having camera issues, okay? Good. And Moshe said, now please, God, forgive their sin of the golden calf. Moshe says in Exodus 32, 32, but it's not, and it brought me out of the book you've written. In other words, said Moshe, listen, uh, if you don't forgive them, God, what's it all about? Just take me out, I'm out of here, okay? Take me out of here, Torah. I don't want to be in this. Which has always raised a big question for me, by the way, how many guys have been written on Torah? Most of which was not granted, but maybe others of his ilk, or perhaps greater, or perhaps lesser than he, asked to be written out of the book, and they were. But that's the theological point. That's not our point here. And then there's the question that David, King David, said in Psalm 139, 8, If I go up to the heavens, God, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Where's God? Where are you with? Where am I? Where do I end and you begin? Where do you end, so to speak, and I begin? If you're everywhere of God, what function do I serve? What do I do as a human being? What, what power do I have if you're everywhere of God? So that raises a major philosophical question. Again, what's the point of it all? Okay. So we're going to wax a little philosophical. We're going to talk about a case that I mentioned just a moment or two ago about cases, two cases that actually happened today at the hospital. And I don't know we go in on Sunday. Today is Sunday. If you're going to be watching this on your extra leisure or not live. 
Sunday, and I don't know how he's going on a Sunday, but I got called in today because, uh, first of all, someone unfortunately passed away. Someone else is struggling with something, okay? We're not going to be talking about the person who passed away, may rest in peace. But the person who's struggling with something, again, I'll reiterate. I'd rather not fall back on our text of Kohelet or Ecclesiastes. I'd rather not just be a text course. I'd rather just be an inquiry course about the point of it all. But once uh, the Yehuda Hanasi, who's known as Rebbe, okay, the teacher prior to Salon, after most of Benu, it said about him in the Talmud and government Messiah, page 85a, a Catholic being taken to the slaughter, and it broke away, hid his head under Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi's cast tan, and load in terror, go, said he, and load in terror, okay? So this calf was about to be slaughtered, right? And he got, he got frightened, and he hid under Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi's cast tan, under his jacket, okay? Hoping that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the Sadiq, would save him. But Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi turned around and said to the calf, who is scarce witless, go, said he, for this, for this you were created. Calf, you were created to be part of a Sabbath meal, perhaps, right? Or Pesach meal, whatever. For this you were created. You're fortunate. You're living out your tachlis. This is the point of your all. You, calf, were created to be slaughtered in the evening. But they said in heaven, since he has no pity, let's bring suffering unto him. Interesting reaction. He waxed too philosophical. The calf was scared witless, okay? Poor little calf was scared witless, but he was about to be slaughtered, you know? And he didn't just say, well, you know, this is what I'm created, this is what I was created for. He wanted to know if he could be saved and ready. And he said, no, no, be brave. This is the point of it all. And he, Rabbi Yudah Hanasi, was, was punished by heaven for being heartless. So there's a point where we, we wax too philosophical, okay? And I'm afraid I'm, I'm falling into that. So catch me if you can, if you catch me doing that. True story. You get paged 11 o'clock this morning, New York time. Rabbi, Mr. Sosa wants to speak to the rabbi. Can you come in? And of course I did. When I get called, even on a Sunday, on uh, some kind of uh, call like that, I, I jump in right away. Okay? So now it's not even indicated to be Jewish, okay, in the patient list. He's listed as non denominational, which either meant that uh, he didn't want to be recorded according to his religion, or he didn't have a listen per se. They had been born Jewish, but he didn't practice, or he came in unconscious and they didn't know his religion. He doesn't have a particularly outstandingly Jewish name, so it would, would easily be uh, overlooked. Anyway, so the man said, my proofs have been there for almost three weeks. He was unconscious for two of those weeks. He was in a coma for two of those weeks, okay? That explains that. So he said to me, Rabbi, I'm contemplating suicide. 79 years old, he's in a coma, coma for two weeks, wakes up, kidneys had failed, he had to be on kidney dialysis for the rest of his life. Which, thank God, ain't the worst, but it ain't great, okay? The person goes to kidney, on kidney dialysis three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, usually. And they sit there for three hours and they have it, their kidneys dialysized. It's a technical term, but be that as it may, it's a process. They're rather passive. It doesn't tend to be painful, though he experienced some pain. And, uh, he was having a rough time. And until then, he wasn't hale and hearty, but he was okay. He was depressed, as you can imagine. Terribly depressed. And he was contemplating suicide. He wanted to know my reaction about that. Okay, now, um, I didn't come out to say that a good man, don't you know that you have a, you have a purpose in life? 
and you can't do that. I used to do that. I used to want to last two of those crosses home. And I ask you what you would have said in that occasion. The truth of the matter is, uh, he has the legal right to decline, decline service, and he could, in all theory, be dead within a week. Okay? He could decline further kidney dialysis and be dead within a week or so. He just needs to sign off on that. So his life is almost literally in his own hands at this point. But he's depressed. He asked to see a rabbi. So I didn't say to him, young, uh, yeah, uh, not young I didn't say to him, sir, you can't do that, even though I believe you can't do that, even though I believe that and the great preponderance of the Jewish tradition believes this too. Your life is not in your own hands, even though legally it is. But ethically it's not, morally it's not, you don't have that choice, okay? Unless God forbid you're in terrible pain, disease is rampant, we keep on treatment, okay? Even in terrible pain, there are ways of treating those things. Even in depression, there are ways of treating those things. But the man was depressed. So what I said to him, which is the clinical response, which is my first response to show him that I'm not judging his action. I said to him, listen, you need to know that suicide runs in the family. But if you commit suicide, maybe one of your children, God forbid, somewhere down the line will, or one of your grandchildren, God forbid, somewhere down the line will. And that always gives the person pause. And it's oftentimes a game changer. They think about that. I didn't tell him, uh, sir, it's an awfully selfish act, so it is. I didn't tell him, sir, think of others around you, which I would have morally had the right to say, but I didn't say that I didn't want to come to him, cross to him, moral, or making moral judgment to him. But, he had this dilemma. He was suffering terribly, and he was shocked, and he was depressed. So that's how I came across to him. I said, think of your children, think of your grandchildren, especially, etc. But we hold there is a meaning to life, and if you hold that there's a meaning to life, then we go on. Because we go on because we need to go on, because there is pathway. There is a point in it all. Now, I'm going to give you some quick points of it all, okay? And uh, I'm going to give you the punchline to tonight's class, because it comes at the end of Kohela, the end of Ecclesiastes, because I don't want to leave you in a spin, okay, in case we get cut off, right? If all of a sudden there's a power blow, and we get cut off and I leave you dangling, philosophically dangling, rather than way philosophical, we're going to whack philosophical, okay? So the end of Kohelet is this, the penultimate line is, is this in chapter 12, verse 13. The end of the matter is, all having been heard, God, uh, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. Okay? Fear God. Keep his commandments, this is the whole of it. This is the point of it all. Okay, that's the punchline. We'll get back to that, God willing, at the end if we have time. But I just want you to know that. So Helen has an answer. That's the punch. I don't want to leave you dangling. He comes up with an answer, but he struggles with it in between. So he gives that answer, he struggles with it. So I'm going to give you a couple of other answers, too. Okay? First of all, I'm going to give you an answer from a, a, a secularist, Victor Frankl, well-known philosopher, survivor of the Holocaust, psychologist, brilliant man. Victor Frankl said the meaning of life differs from person to person, from day to day, and from hour to hour. What matters, therefore, is not the meaning of life in general, but rather the specific meaning of a person's life in a given moment. 
Well, that's all well and true, but there has to be, to my mind, an overarching purpose, an overarching point of it all. I think his point there is that every moment that that point of, of it all is either being challenged or not, and one has to struggle in a different way, but that seems to come with a Victor Franklin. I want to give you the comment of uh, the Moshe Khan with Sato and Deus Hashem. I'm going to read the Hebrew to you, then I'm going to translate it roughly just to get our points across. Make sure, uh, there are not turned away of God in, uh, cha- in, uh, section one, verse, uh, uh, chapter four, paragraph six, he may cherish color in your house, vote who. The whole point of serving God is, here's the other ponet to me with our own. And a human being constantly faces God, encounters God. Who called Lodi with her Ella with Yot is the big Mavoro, and he's only born and created to cling to God, to have this intimate relationship with God Almighty. Now, who said the Zaha Ola with Ella with Yot Kavish as his throne? And he was placed in this world, the world of struggle, so as to win that battle, to fight his ace in her wrath, Shabbat Asmon of her own. And to subjugate himself to his creator, to talk to things out with his mind, to overturn your physicality and your inclination. And to guide everything toward that end. Okay? Without Exception. So that's most of the time we talk about point of it all. So we're here to have this intimate relationship with the Creator. We, we do that by being masters of our own being, by directing our minds and ourselves towards that goal without ever wavering. So we have this great adventure, okay? This incredible adventure. It's deeply self-satisfying, and I hope this camera isn't blowing it up there. Seems it's a little better. I'm sorry, folks. Okay. Uh, so that's that. That's Moshe Hanus Sato. And then we have this quote in the prophet Micah, or Micha. He has shown you, O man, what is good. What does God, the Lord, require of you but to act? justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And this is a great Mishar lesson. This is all students of Mishar. Okay? What God requires of us is to act justly, to be a man, love mercy, and to walk humbly with God, your Lord. So, and again, the first line of Ecclesiastes, of Kohelet, is in the, at the end of the matter, all having been heard, fear God, keep his commandments, and so this is the whole of man. Okay, fine. Again, feel free to write me a private note on the right board or um, on a chat board, raising questions to be carefully. So there is this elderly gentleman this morning, 79 years old, suffering, asking what's the point of it all. He wants to give up on it. He wants to put on the cross. So here we have an elderly man, the author of Kohelet. Okay. The author of Kohelet is not defined, but he identifies himself as the king of Jerusalem, the son of David. He means to say he's Solomon. But he's actually a nameless person who refers to himself as Kohelet, okay? One who gathers crowds around him. Ecclesiastes, he gathers people together. So he's his people together. All right, so according to the, the description of it, Kohelet is an elderly man. He's a king, ergo he's wealthy, he's privileged. And he is now, at the end of his life, life assumedly, Overviewing things and sharing with us his students, his thoughts of life. Okay? 
Now, I'm going to raise this question, which is not asked classically, but it's a mo- and it's a modern question, and I'll ask it because it's a legitimate question. Just because the guy is old, just because he has power and privilege, are his perspectives right? Classically, they said, why, of course, you know. He's seen it all. He's been the king. He's wealthy. He could have experienced anything he wanted to. He's elderly. So he's been through a lot. So, yeah, the classical response is, yeah, he's got it right. But maybe not. In fact, if you experience a study of Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, you'll see that he's struggling. Okay? Now, dear Australia, all struggle. Okay? No one can can convince you that you don't struggle. You can be the greatest rabbi alive, but if you've been alive, you've struggled. Okay, I don't only mean monetary. I don't only mean with your family. I don't only mean with your religious context. I talk about a existential struggle. Okay. I dare say there's not a human being alive who has not at some point or another or longer struggled, wondered about the point of it all, and wondered who had a response. All right, so here we have this elderly gentleman now, talking for Ellis, right? Had been king, had a lot of money at his disposal, could do anything he wants, wants could experience anything he wanted, right? He's seen it all, but he hasn't seen poverty, right? And he hasn't seen powerlessness, and he's a male, okay? But the other thing, he hasn't seen it all. He hasn't seen it all. He has seen a lot of it, but from his perspective. So his answers, even he would agree his answers aren't definitive. The definitive answers he gives at the end are legitimate. I believe them. I accept them. I base my life on his timing that we're here to hear, i.e. to experience God, to do his mitzvah, and I live my life accordingly. I myself have struggled, but I myself accept this response. I hold that this is the point of it all. I don't disagree with Victor Franklin. I don't disagree with most of the time with Sato, so they might disagree with each other. And I don't disagree with Mishan, the prophet. But I agree with Kohelet, but he struggled. All right, so the very famous words of Kohelet we're going to read. Now, unless there are questions from you guys, and I, I wish there would be, I really would love that there would be. But unless there are questions from you guys, I'm going to read the text and I'm going to bounce off of it, okay? If you want to bounce off of my bouncing, feel free. That would be great. That's part of our dialogue. So we're going to spend this week talking about Kohelet. The remainder of this hour talking about Kohelet. Next hour, next week, God willing, we'll be together for our last session. We're going to talk about the book of EO, of Job. Read it if you can. It's hard. Okay, we're going to again ask you then to share your struggles then too. Okay, that'll be more spot on talking about human suffering. So we're going to try to wax and we're going to manage to wane philosophical tonight. If you're struggling with something I touched on, great. If you need responses, raise the question anonymously. Okay, I'm going to read another version of Kohelet, son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanity. Very famous line, Bethel Hevalim, vanity of vanities, nonsense, nonsense, says Kohelet, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. All is nonsense. Gornished to be vanity. Nothing. Everything is nothing, he said. Remarkable. We wouldn't expect anyone in the religious to say that. Hevel Hevalim, nonsense. Everything is nonsense. Gornish, nothing. Gornish, not Gornish, the same image. Nothing but nothing. That's his response. Hevel Hevalim, 
Vanity is vanity, physical health. Vanity, vanity is all is vanity. What profit has man in all of his labor, wherein the labor, wherein he labors under the sun? A very good question, Paul. He says, he, the wealthy man, he, the king, he who has seen it all, who has walked through his kingdom, seeing all his subjects, spoken to them, observed them, heard about their problems, heard about their joys, says, you know, nonsense. Go on, nonsense. Go on, nonsense. How do you Again, the rabbis argued, maybe Kohelet should not be in the Tanakh. Maybe it's too counterproductive. And it's depressing. Nonsense, everything is nonsense these days. What profit has man of all his labor when he labors up with sun? In other words, what's the point? What do you get? All right. I'm still on chapter. We're going to spend uh, a few moments on chapter, each chapter if we can, unless there are questions on the floor. Again, floor. Chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. One generation passes away, and another generation comes. And the earth abides forever. Sun also rises and the sun goes down and hurries to its place where he arises. Everything is circular, round and round. The wind goes towards the south and turns about unto the north, turns about continually in its circuit, and the wind returns again to its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full, and to the place where the rivers go, there they go again. That's his perspective. Nonsense. You throw a ball out, you catch a ball. You throw a ball out, you catch a ball. Okay? You make money, you lose money. You eat, you go to the bathroom. You get, you're born, you die. He says it's nonsense. Okay. Now, if you've ever played ball, you don't play catch, okay? You throw balls around and say, yeah, I can circular. It. It, it's absurd. It's just absurd. You throw, you catch. You throw, you catch. Okay? You make a thousand dollars, you spend a thousand dollars. You make a million dollars, you spend a million dollars. You make 50 cents, you spend 50 cents. If you go back to the ball metaphor, playing itself is fun. Yeah, philosophically it's absurd, it's nonsense, but it's fun. Okay? You make a thousand dollars, you spend a thousand dollars, but yeah, there's victory here, there's defeat, there's adventure. Okay? So life is rather circular. So my question is, is this good or is this bad? To those who are ill, it's good because it shows that there is a circle. To those who are having it good, it's bad because it shows that there is a circle. If everything is secular, secular, right? Cyclical, right? If everything is cyclical, right? If things are good now, things will be bad. If everything is cyclical, things are bad now, things will be good. If things are 60% good now, things will be 40% bad down the line. Or 60, 80, whatever. It's all variable, it's all good. Okay, so it is as bad as it can. So he waxes his first up, but we have, um, Okay. Oh, you try to find. Okay, Livy, uh, I'm assuming this is not private. So, uh, okay. I try to find try to find a way to be satisfied with my lot. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we all do that. We all do that. That's part of the point of it all too. To find a point of satisfaction, and he, Cohen, 
Well, talk about that, and thank you for that question. I appreciate that. We're still on chapter 1, verses 8 through 10 now. All things toil and weariness. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, for the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which shall be done, and there is nothing new until the sun is very famous expression, okay? Someone's asking a big question here, okay? Uh, through prayers and actions, All right, sharing the truth with someone who's suffering, okay? All right, where's my point of all? Okay, you asked it. I don't know who has to question that as well as part of the board, okay? Uh, as I tried to indicate at the top, perhaps we won't leave us. We don't make judgments of the person themselves in their presence whatsoever. We cry with them. We listen to them. We accept them and we love them. But we're also mature about it. We have our own agendas sometimes. We have our own points to get across sometimes. We try not to put the human. If you're going to be a cardboard figure, that's not going to expect to be of a person either, okay? You want to be there for them. Let them know that you love them. But you have to be yourself, too, okay? Thank you for the question. As you knew under the sun, chapter 1, verse 10, is there a thing where else it says, see, this is new, and it's been already, and the ages which were before us. So there's really nothing new under the sun, and it's a very famous expression. Very famous expression. Now, that's depressing or it's enlightening or it's wonderful. If, there, if there's nothing new under the sun, then I can experiment with anything. Okay? But there's nothing new under the sun. Conversely, it's quite bad. Again, this is Kohelet speaking. Chapter, uh, verse 11, chapter 1, there's a remembrance of them of former times. Neither shall there be any remembrance of them of later times, but are to come among those that shall come after. He says, basically, it's a losing game. Okay. No one will remember you when you're gone. God forbid. No one why bother. Again, this is a very depressing part. There are depressing parts of so heavy, very depressing parts of the book. What's the point of it all? So you know when a person passes away according to tradition, say what you say published during the year. Okay. Part of our remembrance. Traditionally we leave services for the year. Traditionally, good stuff, that charity, okay, in the person's memory. Traditionally, a person stays alive because he or she is named for, okay, children, grandchildren, great grandchildren are named after that request, so the name is kept alive, the spirit is kept alive, okay? To go back to our punchline, if life is all about fearing God and keeping his new growth, and if we talk about the afterlife the last few times, then memories are kept alive. But if you're struggling and you're wondering if memories are kept alive, it's legitimate. I can't argue with the struggle. Okay, chapter 1, verses 12 through uh, 18. Skipping there, too. I, Paul have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to sift out my wisdom concerning all things that are done unto heaven. In other words, this is an experiment. Okay? I have the money, I have the time, I have the power to have everything. Yeah. It is a sure task that God has given to the sons of men to be exercised their will. So he says here, walking around ruminating is an obligation, and it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Most of us don't do it. I dare say you, you, because you're a member of the Musar Institute, I dare say all of you think about these things. If you're in this course, perhaps especially for, okay? 
You care about things, you, you question these things, okay? But Kohel says now in his persona, this is not his bottom line, this is his persona now. As the old man he is, as the powerful king that he is and has been, he's going to walk around, he's going to ruminate, and he's going to wonder about what, what it's all about. And he says it's, it's a responsibility and I don't like it. Students of literature, I think, of Walt Whitman. Okay, Whitman was ruminated a lot in his poetry, right? Song of Myself, the very long song of myself in Whitman. He ruminates, he walks across his terrace, he watches his feet, okay? He sees wonderful things, he sees terrible things. This is what Kohelet is talking about. I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. In other words, it's Nonsense and it goes away like the mist. It goes up in smoke. Everything goes up in smoke and it's all in nonsense, he says. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, he says, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. Nothing to be fixed, he says. At this point, as his persona, I spoke with my own heart, Kohelis says, saying, Lo, I have gotten great wisdom more, el more also than all that were before me ever over Jerusalem. Yea, my heart hath had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, he says, and I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also was a striving after wind. We wouldn't expect that. We expect him to say, well, I'm really a lucky guy. I get to walk around and ask questions and interview people. He says, this is nonsense. This too will go up in smoke. Of course, he's wrong. We're discussing his words now. Thousands of years later, ironically, all his pessimism is up in smoke. Because we're discussing his pessimism. His pessimism is set in stone. That's the irony, okay? This is a very ironic book. For much wisdom is much vexation. And he that increases knowledge increases sorrow. We wouldn't expect that either. Don't be too smart. Did your mother ever tell you that? Don't be too smart. Sometimes you know too much. It's better not to know too much. If you know too much, but you don't know it all. You don't know enough. And you've worked all that hard to, to know, worked all that hard to know what you do now. Okay. Again, we don't expect this. We don't expect this at all. But to chapter two, any more questions now? Thanks for that question. Ah. This is a public question. No, this is private. Okay. Someone asked, how do we best emphasize the Muna faith to one who is suffering or even facing death? All you can do is share your own faith. That's all I ever do. I don't argue faith. Faith is by definition intangible. You can't touch it. It's something in your heart. It's something I dare say you inherit. My mother may she rest in peace as a great believer. My mother would talk to God. She just talked to God. I never forgot that, obviously. My mother, she died for 14 years. She talked to God. God was real to her. God's real to me. My mother's greatest gift to me was her rock solid faith in God. I don't want to wax philosophical with you about belief in God. One can. Whole books, whole libraries about written about belief in God. And the reality of God's being, all you can do is share. Okay? There's an expression that kind of will come from the lay of will come from the heart, goes to the heart. If you speak from your heart of your faith and God, you don't come across, right, as you're evangelical about it, that you're just sharing what you're really experiencing from your heart, it will enter the heart. I've seen people change when they're desperately ill. They start to believe. 
when people are not changed. The expression there, no atheists in the foxhole, is wrong. Well, there are. I mean, we don't know what happens in a person's heart. We don't know. We don't know what a person says to himself and his or her God. We don't know. But there are people who do turn over before they die. Others who seemingly do not. I don't know. All you can do is share to the person who is expressing his grace. Okay. Gary, uh, to everyone, most people struggle with challenges and illness because they cannot make sense of it or see purpose in that suffering. When it comes to it, uh, comes to it harms their life and ability to serve God. Of course it does. That's the irony. If you can't serve God because you're ill, how can you serve God when you're ill? You can serve God with your heart, of course. If you serve God ironically by letting others you. We tell this to all good people. Okay, my wife is a nurse, right? She and I talk cases. We see wonderful things about humanity in this business. We see terrible things. The wonderful things we see are the things that family does to family when it's good. When it's good, it's very good. When it's bad, it's very bad. But when it's good, you're, let's say, God forbid, you're desperately ill, you can't do a blessed thing, and you have family, you're allowing them to do acts of charity to you. You're allowing them, you're giving them the, the chance to be able to take people that are capable of being, but they're no longer the person you're capable of being. You're granting them that. Um, Everything has its good reasons. They ask the Hasidic Rebbe, if everything for the good, what's the good of atheism? He said, when it comes to giving stuff, when it comes to giving charity, be an atheist. Don't just wait for God to give you this. The point of everything, you know, this has its point. Family can become great, helping the ill. They can become terrible, too. But they can become great. I've seen it. I've seen Rather small people become rather large in goodness when called upon to be there. Okay, we're going to chapter two. That's a very deep question. We're going to chapter two. I said there's two. I said of laughter, it's mad and of mirth. What does it accomplish? That's a good question. Feels good to laugh, right? Feels great to be with friends, family to laugh. But then it's gone. I mean, it's gone. As soon as it's over, it's over. Right? He's raising this question. Kohelet is talking in chapter 2, verses 4 through 11, with a strip or two. I made a great work. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. It's all been like, okay? I'm not being Popeye's father here. Okay? He says, I was king. I made these gardens and parks. I, I planted trees and them all kinds of fruit. I made these pools of water. To water there from, there from the, word, the wood springing up with trees. I acquired man service and maid service and had servants born to my house. Also had great possessions of herds and flocks above all that were before me in Jerusalem. I was a very wealthy guy, he said. I gathered we also silver and gold and treasures such things as kings and the provinces have as their own. I got me men singers and women singers and the lights of the sounds of men, women, very many. So I was great, Kohela says, and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom stood me instead. He said, I really did good. I did very well. I was wealthy. I had everything you want. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I didn't hold myself back. I was held not my heart from any joy, for my heart had joy of all my labor, and this was my portion from all my labor. I really enjoyed myself. But I looked at all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do in the whole. All was vanity. I'm striving after wind. In other words, everything goes up and smoke, and it's nonsense. 
And there is no profit under the sun. I'm not talking about people who started off wealthy and became poor. That was just happened. I know of people who experienced that or the opposite. And somebody's talking about I'm saying being wealthy, staying wealthy, or being successful, staying successful. It's still nonsense. It still goes up and up, goes up and smoke. It's intangible. It's tangible for the wild. So I hated life, he says, verses 17 to 18. I hated life because this, the work that is wrought under the sun was grievous to me. All this vanity and a striving after wind. I hated all my labors, wherein I labored under the sun, seeing that I must leave it unto the man that shall be after me. If I make $18 million, right? So my kids will inherit eighteen million dollars. That's his point. He goes, he skips chap, uh, chapter uh, two, verse twenty-four. There's nothing, and he comes to one understanding. This is not final. There's nothing better for man than that he should eat and drink, and make his soul enjoy pleasure for his labor. This also I saw that this is this. That that is from the hand of God. He really wants to say, enjoy life. And there's wisdom to that. You know, if you have kosher enjoyment, you have family, right? You're a good person. You have ethical income, right? You've been good to others. And you have a lot. And you've done it legally ethically and morally, enjoy. You give stuff out, it's not just cut behind. You share it with the poor, you share it with family, etc., etc. This is great too. He says at that point. Now this is not his bottom line. Again, he told you to punch, we'll get back to that at the end. This is not his bottom line. This is his decision at the moment. He could live good in an ethical way. Chapter 3. This is very famous. If, you, if an old guy like me, if an old woman like others, this is from the birds from 1960. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Remember this song? It's from Kohelet, it's from Ecclesiastes. Chapter 3, verses 1 through um, 8. Everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time to war and a time to peace. Getting very close to the end. I just want to say there's so much more to read, so much more to say. It's invisible. It's invisible. We learned that the last time. There's an afterlife, right? There's a world to come, there's something way beyond us, something way before us. You know, don't forget we talked about the afterlife and the world, we kind of didn't talk about what preceded us. We didn't talk about nothingness, so we didn't talk about this heaven we came from that we'll go back to. We didn't talk about the raw state of the soul before it enters into the body. We talked about the raw state of the soul after it leaves the body. But there's an invisible realm. There is a point in of it all. Life has meaning. Life is a struggle. 
there's pain. I know it personally. Others in my family have known it personally. I see it at work. I see good two things, good things to thank God. I see healing on all levels. I see people getting well. They didn't expect to. I see people being big who are small. And many mixtures done. Many good things coming about. Many doctors being special. Nurses being special. But it's difficult. It can't be so heartless as, like the Yehuda HaNasi that says, listen, if you're going to be sacrificed, calf, if you're going to be sacrificed and killed, deal with it. This is the point of it all. You were born to be sacrificed and eaten. No, we can't be, we can't lack that philosophical. Not fair. There are times to be philosophical. There are times to cry. If people are in pain, and they are, there are many people in pain, you sit with them. You sit with them, you cry with them, you laugh with them, you hold their hand, you don't. You accept them, you love them. You express what you need to express, you're only human as well. If you're afraid to be with them, I understand. If they're afraid to be with you, I understand. The sick experience something we don't expect, you know. The experience shame. This is the talk around a lot. But people are shamed. They're very abashed when they're ill because they're not Superman anymore. They're not Superwoman anymore. They're merely mortal. The bones are starting to fall apart. The skin is starting to melt. They're embarrassed and they're abashed. And they think they've lived a lie. Like Kohelet, like Ecclesiastes, they've seen a lot, they've seen perhaps they've been very successful or somewhat successful. But it's all garnish nonsense. Goes up in smoke. But it doesn't. Punchline again, the very last, the penultimate line, all having been said. Fear of God, do as an vote, that's your end as a human being. To, to work up this relationship with God Almighty, to understand that you don't know what's going on behind the scenes, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, we have some ideas, we have traditions about that, but we don't know, God knows. Okay? If there's anything we're to do on this slide, it's to be wise enough to realize we're not wise enough. It's tough. We'll be together next week to talk about Job. Job had a rough life. Rough life. He started out very successful. He came to be very successful. It all went under him. All went under him. Went up in smoke. Lost his children. Lost his the property lost his, almost lost his life, suffered himself to look um, terribly physically. We'll see how he dealt with that. Until next week, I wish you all well.